What's up, everybody? Welcome to Heresy Financial. My name is Joe Brown. Recently, I was sent an article written by Nick Maioli. He writes on ofdollarsanddata.com, and he's the chief operating officer of Ritholz Wealth Management. And I wanted to go over this. This article was uh, actually written a while ago, about a year and a half ago now. But uh, it's particularly important deal, you know, regarding what we're dealing with right now, our current macroeconomic environment with the insanely, uh, you know, historic monetary stimulus that the entire world has seen, the uh, expansion of the global money supply, the expansion, the explosion really of debt. And uh, the article is called When Money Dies. And uh, it's titled after the a book of the same name by Adam Ferguson. And uh, really, it's just talking about what, what's the best way to protect yourself in the case of uh, really a monetary failure when the currency that is being used as money just completely completely fails and dies. And the reason why I want to talk about this uh, this specific article is uh, simply because uh, it uh, it, re it made me realize that there are some uh, misunderstandings about what it means to protect yourself against a monetary failure or a monetary reset or uh, you know a, a hyperinflation scenario. There are some misunderstandings as to what people mean when they say protect against that. So I want to clarify that and uh, use a couple points from the article because it's well written and I'll link it in the description below for anybody to read afterwards as well. Ready? Let's dive in. Monetary systems have failed many times throughout history. In fact, every single fiat currency that's ever been created has eventually failed, except for the few that we still have today that have all lost at least 95% of their value since inception, and they're continuing to uh, approach zero. That's their inevitable destination. So what this allows us to do is it allows us to go look back at history and see, number one, what are the causes uh, of, uh, of money going to zero? And when I say money, I'm using interchangeably with currency. I know that, you know, that it's really semantics. Uh, most people use the word money when they're talking about dollars or yen or whatever their currency is. And so I'm just using, you know, common vernacular here. So I know that sound money is different than fiat money. Hard money is not uh, currency, just using common vernacular here. So the first thing in this article by Nick is that he's talking about Bitcoin and he says, hey, there's a lot of people projecting that in a monetary failure, the price of Bitcoin could reach a million dollars. And that's absolutely true. Uh, what's also true is that the price of a loaf of bread could reach a million dollars. And uh, we see that uh, in, uh, in, in in societies and countries where there is a hyperinflationary collapse of the currency, you see these massive price increases of everything because there's just been so much money pumped into the system. There's no change or uh, there's a potentially a negative change in the goods and services, but the uh, the amount of money that's pumped in, all that does is like you're taking one pizza and you're cutting it up into multiple slices. You still have, you just have to eat more slices because these slices are smaller in order to equal the same amount of pizza. So it's the same thing with money versus the goods and services in an economy. If you pump in uh, more money, all you're doing is uh, making each existing uh, unit of currency worth less relative to what it was worth before. So that means it takes takes more of those currency units in order to buy the same things. And the only times that you have uh, an increase in the total supply of money while not having an increase in the general level of prices is when there's you know actual real growth enough to compensate for that. So it's like, hey, you're taking a pizza and uh, you're cutting more slices into it, but at the same time, that pizza is actually growing. That means that each slice of pizza is still gonna be the same uh, you know, amount, total amount of pizza as it was before. That doesn't mean that there's been no inflation. That means that you're robbing uh, everybody of the increase of purchasing power that they would have had since there was growth, but you offset it by increasing the total supply of currency in the system. Their dollars would have gone further, but instead now they only go the same because there was growth to, to offset the inflation. So he talks about Bitcoin and he says, just because the price of Bitcoin potentially goes to, you know, a million dollars, that doesn't mean that you're going to buy be able to buy $1 million worth of stuff with that. You, you really need to pay attention to purchasing power over price. That is 100% true. My only uh, caveat to, to uh, Bitcoin and even gold somewhat, if you watch my uh, my last video about how the, I believe it, right now it looks like the fair value of gold is much higher than the current price of gold uh, due to the uh, massive uh, shorts in the 
system. But uh, if you uh, if you have a, uh, p a new money kind of evolve uh, to take over an existing money, you're going to have an increase in purchasing power. Uh, so it's uh, it's especially something like Bitcoin, where the market cap is still so small compared to other uh, currencies and other forms of stores of value. If you do have, you know, kind of a, a newcomer, a challenger take over the incumbent, uh, by definition, you're going to have an increase in purchasing power. It's not until it becomes a, a real replacement and it becomes, you know, let's say in today's dollars until it hits that million dollar price point or the $400,000 price point or whatever it is that you would have that stability then in the hard money where your purchasing power really stays the same. So with Bitcoin specifically, we're nowhere near that. So if Bitcoin does become uh, a, a global reserve currency, you still have a long way to go where the actual purchasing power has to increase per Bitcoin in order to get to that point where uh, it becomes, you know, real global sound money and its purchasing power stays steady like uh, gold has done for thousands of years. Now, the second point that he makes is that if you look at uh, isolated incidences of hyperinflation throughout history, you see that investing in other currencies isn't necessarily the best way to hedge against inflation in your own currency. And that's only true depending on how you uh, it, how you define uh, hedge or protect. Specifically, if we look at the, uh, the Weimar Republic in Germany, Germany. And uh, when you look at uh, what happened to the hyperinflation there with the mark, uh, you, you see that versus the US dollar, uh, the value of this uh, of the mark of their German, their, their currency, it plummeted. And so the prices of everything went up. Now, if you remember at that time, this was the 20s. And so if you remember, the US dollar was equal to gold at that point. So the value of the dollar didn't change because the value of gold wasn't changing. And so when you're comparing the mark versus the USD during that time, you're really comparing the mark versus gold. This is why gold is looked at and potentially in the future Bitcoin will be looked at as savings because the purpose of savings is a store of value. It's not to make you rich. It's to keep your purchasing power steady and store it for you until you're ready to deploy it. So when you look at a hedge against inflation, you have to ask, are you looking for something that's going to protect your purchasing power so that when everything else goes on sale, you can purchase that? Or are you looking for something that's going to gain in value while everything else is dropping. Those are two different things. One is savings. One is investment. Sound currencies or sound money, those are forms of savings. And savings do not increase in value over time. They stay steady. Again, the one caveat being if we have a new form of sound money come into existence like Bitcoin, then it has to increase in value in order to evolve into being that store of value. But once it has reached that point, uh, just like gold is, uh, you don't have a change in, uh, in actual purchasing power over time. And so what it's going to do for you is provide savings savings that you know, it's not going to make you money, but it's not going to lose you money either when you're calculating purchasing power. Now, this is not true of stocks, and this is where it actually gets interesting. Assets like real estate and stocks actually do very well in hyperinflationary environments. They do more than just protect their purchasing power. What they actually do is they grow because as currencies fail, the people with the large amounts of money, they escape that currency. And one of the easiest and most common ways to escape a currency currency is to sell that currency. Well, what is another term or another uh, way of saying you're going to sell a currency? It's to buy something with it because every transaction is the simultaneous purchase and sale of something. Now, most of us are used to saying, hey, when I buy something, that means I'm giving somebody dollars. But at the same time, what you're actually doing is selling dollars. When you buy a burger, you're selling dollars for the burger. When you go to work and collect a paycheck, you're selling labor to buy dollars. So every transaction is simultaneously a buy and a sell of something. And so when you buy real estate, when you buy stocks, when you buy a loaf of bread for that matter, you're actually selling dollars. So why would you sell something? Because you think it's going to be worth less in the future than it is right now. And so if you if you see that a currency is declining in value very quickly, you're going to want to sell it as fast as possible. And so the best thing to do is to sell it for something that is going to maintain or increase its value, right? And so buy stocks and buy real estate. That's what these people did. And that's why the value actually went up even when you measure it against gold. Now, measure it against gold, these uh, assets like stocks and real estate didn't actually do as well as when you measure them versus the local currency, which makes sense. That currency is falling 
and the, 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 the gold or the US dollar is not, right? And so it depends on how you measure it. If you measure it with a centimeter and a centimeter is, you know, uh, shrinking, it's going to look like it's growing a lot faster than if you measure it with inches and inches are, you know, staying the same. Now, the kicker comes in with debt. Now, this is where uh, things start to get, uh, you start to take on more risk, but this is where returns really multiply because when you take out debt, when you borrow currency units in, in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a currency that is headed to zero, the uh, the real cost of repaying that debt approaches zero. And so when you look at these incidences of hyperinflation, wherever they've ever occurred, whether it's Argentina or Zimbabwe or Lebanon or, or Weimar Germany or any other time that it's happened throughout history, what you see is that the people who got rich were the ones who shorted the dollar through debt. They took out a bunch of debt and used that debt to buy assets because you're essentially saying, hey, give me some of this paper. I'm going to use some of this paper you know, you're borrowing paper, right? You're going to use that and you're going to purchase something that uh, is going to maintain or it's going to increase in value. And uh, when this hyperinflation happens, there's so much money in the system that it is, uh, you know, almost free to get your hands on new units of that currency later on in order to repay that debt. The, uh, the actual cost, the real cost approaches zero of paying that debt back. And so you're basically getting assets for free on the flip side this means that the people who loaned that money lost everything. And so this is why I always say that loans right now are some of the riskiest investments if you're loaning money. And when you keep money in a bank, when you buy a CD, when you buy a bond, these are all forms of loaning money. Because by the time you get that money back, the amount of stuff you can purchase with it, even when you account for the interest that you were paid, the amount of stuff that you can purchase with it is a lot less than what it was before. And this accelerates during periods of hyperinflation. So the creditors are wiped out. And the interesting part about this is who are the biggest creditors? The banks. So this is why I've been saying that as we accelerate along this path, we're going to see more centralization and more nationalization of the entire credit markets through the banks. We're going to see them, you know, kind of absorb each other and really get nationalized and pulled under the end. All the credit markets are going to have to get pulled under the Federal Reserve because as we accelerate along this path, the, the entire uh, infrastructure becomes less profitable. And so banks as for-profit companies, they can't exist exist anymore because their entire way of doing business no longer produces any real profits. And so the only way to continue to have this system go to delay the pain as much as possible is to completely nationalize that, put it underneath a system that doesn't care about profit and loss, such as the Federal Reserve and ultimately underneath the Treasury. Now, ultimately, what these hyperinflationary monetary collapses always lead to is a reinstitution of uh, sound money. And so all throughout history for thousands of years, that has been a new gold standard of some form. It's possible that the next time that this happens, it's a Bitcoin standard instead of a gold standard. But if history has anything to say about it, it will probably be a gold standard. Either way, though, it doesn't matter because a new system with sound money at its base is a good system. It is deflationary. It means people get more for less. It transfers wealth from the rich to the poor rather than an inflationary system, which transfers wealth from the poor to the rich. It uh, incentivizes savings. It incentivizes low time preference. It builds uh, wealth and investment on savings rather than on debt. It makes individual fragility uh, possible. It makes individual failure possible, which means that the entire system is anti-fragile and robust and it grows because all of the failure points, they get weeded out of the system rather than a debt-based inflationary system that we have right now, where it uh, tries to rescue all the failure and prevent any failure, meaning that it causes fragility for the system as a whole. And so yes, these monetary collapses, they're painful while they happen, except for the few people that are able to see it coming and prepare accordingly. But afterwards, when it's rebuilt from the ground up on the foundation of sound money, you have massive wealth and growth and prosperity for all. It's a much better system. So when money dies, when currency dies, when monetary resets happen, when there are currency collapses, they are painful. But I am locked and loaded. I'm prepared. I'm ready for what comes on the other side. As always, I really appreciate you guys. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.